And if we have a full room, we didn't expect it, but it really happened. So my name is Katya Radeva. I'm the principal software engineer at Red Hat. I'm Sandia, a software engineer at Red Hat 2. And today we're going to talk about how we wanted to implement a machine learning model that went ahead to production a really simpler statistical model. So this is the agenda for today's talk. So we're going to talk about some uh, possible challenges we might face uh, when uh, training our model. And then even after you have a model trained, you still have a long way to go to bring that model to production. So we're going to come back to that slide at the end of the presentation. So if you've been following AI news and papers in the last five years, you might have noticed that there's a lot of information about the algorithms themselves, but there is way less emphasis on the data. In, I would say in the last year, the emphasis actually has shifted to the models, which is both the algorithm and the data, um, but there's still a lot of information about that. So today we wanted to talk about um, different, same algorithms uh, with different data will perform uh, differently solving different problems. So we don't want to talk about the algorithm themselves because there's a lot of information about that on the internet. We want to focus on the challenges that most uh, people would face trying to bring it to production. Uh, yeah. We are going to tell you about our experience. So we're going to give, a, give you a bit of context. We are part of OpenShift, which is an enterprise solution bring by Red Hat. Uh, probably most of you know about it. Uh, it's basically for operating containers. Um, what we do is getting a bunch of data from our customers' uh, OpenShift clusters. We process that data and generate a couple of graphs, notifications, emails, and recommendations for the customers to better manage their uh, clusters. The last project that we participated in is the upgrade risk predictions, update risk predictions. Um, it's the project that we are going to talk about today. And um, it basically predicts whether an OpenShift update will break the cluster or, or not. That's the point. So before starting with a machine learning model, you first need to make sure that you understand the problem that you are going to solve. Otherwise, you will be completely lost. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about the, um, the problem statement first. So, first you need to identify what is the actual problem your uh, model will try to solve. So, uh, operating in a system, as you know, comes with a cost. But it's even higher cost uh, getting that system out of a failed state. So because you have time emergencies, you have the user screaming at you, so it's usually very expensive for the brand, for the money, and for you. So uh, these are some examples of real life failures. So for example, imagine having to deal with a water leak on a Monday morning when you need to go to work. Or uh, an airplane engine failure during uh, takeoff. So another example, I'm not sure if I find the right icon, but this was supposed to be tsunami or an earthquake. So uh, tsunami or an earthquake in a highly populated area. And this one is an example for a bridge collapse because uh, there are either too many cars or it was uh, unmaintained. So all of these can be mitigated or monitored. For example, airplanes usually um, have regular inspections for everything, like engines, uh, landing gear, and so on. The same for uh, bridges. But for example, for earthquakes and tsunamis, we have uh, monitoring. So usually peop uh, some scientists or technology agencies will send uh, forewarning when they detect some shakes. So it's way cheaper to try to prevent a failure than deal with the uh, outcome of that failure. It can be expensive both with money and as we've seen airplane, earthquake, and even the bridge collapsing example, it can cost you money. So we're not going to be that uh, so we are not dealing with human life factor, but we try to save the money uh, for our customers. So some examples close to your home since it's DEF CON. Uh, for example, uh, imagine a service failing to serve requests because it's out of resources. It's 
So you can mitigate it by setting up monitoring that will automatically scale it up and down, or you can use Kubernetes. Uh, another example is you try to deploy a new version of your software, and then late in the process, you notice that there are some failed dependencies. So you can uh, use uh, tests, end-to-end -end unit tests to detect that sooner, CI, CD, or you can use stage environment. Or you can use all three of them if you really want to prevent these kind of failures. So um, <clears throat> uh, let's think about modern cars. So modern cars are both combination of hardware and software. Increasingly more, especially example, I think everyone knows it's Tesla. So they have hundreds of sensors in those cars measuring everything. And those uh, cars, they send a lot of telemetry to the manufacturer. <clears throat> so, example of those sensors is if they can measure the state of the battery, the state of the brakes, the tires, uh, if there are any oil leaks, what is the oil level, uh, and so on. So, there is a lot of that, that information. Um, we probably have here people from different countries. Uh, probably in every country there is a car checkup. So when you bring your car to some government approved agency where they check your car and tell you if you're allowed to go on the streets or not. So usually there's like once a year, once four years, depends on the age of the car, at least in Spain. <clears throat> so the way that uh, car checkup goes is you take half a day of work, you drive there, you wait there for two hours, true story, then uh, you go through the car checkup and then at the end of it the engineer says well your brakes are not really working you have a problem with discs or uh, you have ball tires so after that you take your car to the mechanic uh, you fix it and then you go for that checkup again so basically you have days of your time wasted that could have been prevented if there was proper monitoring for the car so what if we could do something different what if your car were able to tell you if it's going to fail the checkup and what is that you need to fix before you actually go for that checkup? Or closer again to our example, remember uh, what Juan was showing, uh, the appli our application was we wanted to predict the upgrade failures for our software. So what if we could predict those upgrade failures? Because after an upgrade has failed, it's usually an emergency, especially if it affects customer workloads. So a lot of people need to jump in, spend a lot of time, and yeah, great damage. So what if we could predict those uh, upgrade failures? <coughs> um, so now that you understand the problem that we are trying to solve, every machine learning model depends on the data set you have. So the typical data set that you will have for machine learning projects looks like this. This is an example from a typical problem. It's about uh, predicting the sale price of a house based on the size of the house and the number of, of bedrooms. Uh, if any of you have tried Kaggle, you've probably uh, tried this problem. Um, in machine learning, you have features and labels. The features is the data that you have in the real life, and the label is the data that you want to predict. In our case, we have a bunch of alerts and issues, and we want to predict whether this will make the cluster fail or not. So, apart from the front statement, the data set, make sure that you are bringing some business value to the company. Otherwise, you are just spending resources and money and not bringing anything valuable for it. So, these are the three steps you have to follow before starting a machine learning project. Uh, we'll continue the rest of the path. And this is, was just the beginning. So you identify that you have a problem, that you have some data to try, and it's probably worth at least researching uh, how to solve it. Then after that, you have a go-ahead from I don't know, uh, someone in your company saying, OK, we're going to spend some time solving that issue. You will have to train a model that uh, solve, uh, you, you would have to train a model that actually resolves the user's problem and then you still need to bring it to production. So there was a talk earlier in this room where they showed that actually when productizing the code for the model itself is like 10% of the whole uh, pipeline. <clears throat> so let's talk about model challenges. 
Uh, first thing before you actually write any code, well, you can try playing, doing some EDA, but we really recommend to think what does success means to you. So what is the definition for success for this project? So uh, we think that it's really important to get your uh, business folks, your customer facing people, your data scientists, engineers, ML people, so anyone that would have to um, participate to make the project successful, to get them into the same room and don't let them out before they agree on the acceptance criteria for the project. And bring pizza, because it will take a lot of time. <laughs> <clears throat> then you have to agree on those acceptance criteria. So, uh, as you have probably heard, AI, ML, it's all the hype right now, but under the hood, what it actually is, it's just creative math. So it needs some optimization mechanisms, metrics, to, for the model itself, for the algorithm, to understand the worse and the better outcome to use it for the next training iteration. <clears throat> so uh, the choice of a metric, so we're not going to talk too much about metrics because it deserves its own talk, um, but uh, in our case, uh, uh, in general, your choice of metric will depend on uh, your the problem that you're trying to solve and the data that you actually have. So, um, in our case, we have way more upgrade successes than upgrade failures, thank God. And, but we also don't really care about predicting upgrade successes because, well, it's like with Karchik, who cares that it's successful, we really want to know what it fails. So, uh, we have an anomaly detection type of problem. So, we really want to identify upgrade failures. <coughs> What we really do care about is, we really care about it, uh, minimizing false positives. I used this right now for minimizing. Uh, we really care about minimizing false positives and we somewhat care about minimizing false negatives. I know these are uh, fancy statistics words, but what it means is, uh, in this case, so we're trying to predict a great failure. Uh, false positive is we predict that the upgrade would fail, but it actually succeeds. And false negative is the other way around. So we predict that the upgrade would um, succeed, but it actually fails. The reason we really care about false positives is if we predict that the upgrade would fail, but it actually succeeds, it brings, um, it can hurt our brand, our uh, perception of our product by the customers. They're like, hmm, we see that in your portal that the upgrade is going to fail. This is your product, so you're kind of responsible for the upgrade of that product. So it might hurt us uh, as a brand, as a company. And the other reason is it might discourage the customers from upgrading to the latest version. And we really want them to be on the latest version. Uh, the second one, false negatives, we still kind of care about that. But with Kubernetes, we have accepted that it's not always possible. So false negatives uh, is when we predict that the upgrade would succeed, but it actually fails. So we cannot predict all the configurations that people use for Kubernetes. So they can use uh, different cloud platforms. It can be on-prem. We cannot control the DNS setup that they have. So we cannot uh, predict all 100% of the failures. So we accepted that, and we really try to minimize so we try to be really precise about it. So I also put here the official call, the names for each of those metrics. So we, again, we really care about precision, we somewhat care about uh, recall. If you've, I don't know, taken some statistics classes before, you might know that they are related to type one and type two errors in statistics. <clears throat> so uh, do we have AI, ML enthusiasts here? Uh, so uh, we didn't want, we were debating if including this slide or uh, not, but because we try to avoid fancy long formulas because we wanted to keep it really uh, high level. But essentially this formula is the expression of this. We care about precision more than recall, and this formula expresses, so this is F score, and here uh, by choosing uh, 0.5 coefficient, we specify, this means that we care about precision twice as much as about recall. So this is our chosen metric for this project. 
and it's always easier, uh, it's always better to have one single metric to guide your project because you cannot train a model using several um, uh, metrics because it needs to know what it uh, has to optimize for. <clears throat> then the next step is you need to create some sort of baseline. So it can be uh, either some crude heuristic, so you can use a script uh, that is using some assumptions, so it's not machine learning yet, but you are, you are identifying the acceptance uh, floor and ceiling for what is actually possible out there. <clears throat> you can also use humans, like human labelers, to see what is possible. One example is, we've all seen this before, recaptures, so uh, before I usually use some either API, last time I've seen it was a couple of days ago with ChatGPT, when uh, they ask you to identify what do you see in this, find all the bicycle boats, whatever. So, um, <clears throat> but even for humans, it's not always possible to identify objects in the picture. So 100% uh, accuracy is not always possible. So aiming for 100% accuracy for your machine model, learn, uh, for your machine model is also usually not acceptable. So, yeah, it took me a while. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, the reason you create a baseline is, again, to establish the borders, so the ceiling and the floor for what is kind of possible. Um, you examine your data so you know what is there instead of just shoving it into some algorithm. And the second one, it either makes or lets you talk with the subject matter experts. So they can guide you, okay, but based on our experience, this doesn't really make sense. So you can create intuition while working through a baseline. And after you have a baseline, you can start experimenting with some automated solutions, so some machine learning model, either pre-trained or take the algorithm and train it uh, on your data yourself. Uh, trying to uh, approximate either the human level performance or beat the uh, baseline. And after that, you keep iterating. <clears throat> Throughout all of these steps, it's important to keep the real problem you're trying to solve in mind. Because most of the machine learning projects, they take this couple of years from the moment of you have an idea to do something and then bring it to, it to production. Usually, uh, your understanding of the goal might evolve, but it's important that you keep talking to the business folks, to someone who would close to the customer, that it still meets what uh, they expect from your solution. <clears throat> and throughout all of this, iterate, go to previous steps, pivot if you need. Uh, it can be a long road. Remember, OpenAI didn't stop at GPT-2. They went to a GPT-3 and the whole hype of the last year, I think it was November. Uh, so they finally delivered something that excited millions of people. <clears throat> okay, um, you may be asking why we are selling this if the title of the talk was about not using machine learning and using an equal system. So all that we have talked about that, uh, in the past minutes is about mm -hmm. things that we learned by <laughs> issues. So now please tell us the issues that we had. So we created a baseline, we trained some machine learning models, uh, we defined our metrics, so we did all the homework, but what we found out is that all of them performed kind of the same. So our simpler heuristic had a similar accuracy to uh, decision trees, to large language models, and so on. So we had to find why. Uh, while we were chasing the reasons why it performed worse, we decided to, uh, since our heuristic worked, and uh, we decided to iterate fast, we decided to go to preview, well not, it's still production, but like a preview feature. We decided to go with a simpler statistical model instead of machine learning model because it, because it still automates things, it brings value, um, even though it's not as fancy as uh, we wanted. Uh, now, the theories why actually is many machine learning models uh, on your data may perform the same. Actually, the reason is usually the data that you have. So, we are currently chasing several theories. So the, one of the theories that we have is maybe the data that we trained on doesn't have enough predictive signal. 
So imagine with a car example, if you fail a car checkup because your uh, brake discs are worn out, if we don't have a sensor on the uh, braking disc, you will not be able to predict uh, the failure checkup. So we are currently chasing additional signal, probably metrics in this case. So we are performing some tests there. Another one is maybe the data is either not complex enough or not denoised enough. Um, so, uh, usually for machine learning models to get an edge over some simpler solution, you need lots of data and it needs to be complex enough for it to be able to detect more subtle uh, patterns. So, uh, we are denoising the data set and we are getting more data for a longer time frame to see how it will impact the performance. Uh, <clears throat> another lead that we have, this is like detecting work. Uh, another lead that we have, maybe the labels that we have are incorrect. So with a failed car checkup, it's very Boolean. So uh, the engineer says, well, okay, you failed because we performed these 20 tests and this one was bad. But how many of you have worked with Kubernetes before? So as you know, with Kubernetes and its self-healing architecture, it will try to reconcile for a long time. So take <coughs> Technically, in Kubernetes, there is no concept of failure unless you specifically define it. It will, it's like lack of success for a certain amount of time. So in this case, we decided to treat a great failure uh, if we didn't see a great success within eight hours. But there might be multiple reasons why um, the upgrade can take more than those eight hours. For example, huge clusters with a lot of worker nodes. They, uh, customer may set up uh, disruption budgets that prevent the node from draining. So it's a healthy cluster, but some configuration prevents the upgrade from succeeding with that. So we are currently inspecting if classifying into upgrade failure, upgrade success is correct. So maybe we should lower the threshold to four hours. Recommendation from our upgrade engineers is like, they expect the control plane to upgrade within two hours. So maybe lowering it to four to two hours is a good idea. Another idea that we are investigating is maybe we need to, we better predict upgrades that went uh, successful without human intervention versus upgrades that required some human, some operator to go and kick in the tires. The problem with that is this will probably help the accuracy, but how do we identify that in the data? The customers are not going to go to us and say, well, I went there and I fixed it manually. So it's going to be more difficult to create a proper data set for that, but we're going to try it. So. <clears throat> and the last one is in Kubernetes, some errors are expected by design. So metrics, uh, you will see, uh, for example, from kubeapi during some restarts, you will see that 404 is returned from kubeapi, And this is normal situation during the restarts. So uh, usually we call them uh, flapping alerts metrics when it's coming up for three to five minutes and then it self results. So it's important to either uh, have the algorithm, well, have the algorithm that is smart enough to be able to ignore those fluctuations or you can pre-clean the data set to exploit those things. So yeah, we launched it with a rule-based model instead of a mm -hmm. machine learning model. And we are not ashamed about it. Uh, it was a nice path, and we learned a lot of things. We also didn't refuse to use oops, machine learning at all. Uh, we we are continuing with the with the studies, and we hope to have a proper model working in the close future. And instead of the, of stopping, we keep moving and put this model in production because it's worth it. We now have everything in production ready for putting a machine learning model whenever it's ready. So, I'm. I think it went out of focus. Oh. Yeah, so I'm not going to talk about the politicization challenges and what we learned during this path. Uh, I'm just going to share some advice, but there were many other things. But let's start with communication. It's not just for machine learning projects, it's out any kind of project. Uh, if you have many groups working the same project, many of them will have some issues, blockers, timings, and you have to collaborate and coordinate in some way. 
if you start coordinating by yourself, it can be a complete mess. You keep adding communication channels, channels, mm -hmm. and you end up with this kind of number of channels. It's just a simple formula. <laughs> but you should take a coordinator, call it the project manager, product owner, whatever persona. Um, it's really important because it's the responsible of um, meeting deadlines, uh, and making sure that when a team commits commits for a deadline that it's met, and also for running like weekly meetings or sync meetings, status meetings, so that everyone understands the progress, the blockers, and what needs to be done. A good way of making sure that everyone understands what needs to be done is with uh, API specs. If you are working with microservices, it's really nice to have an open API spec beforehand, before uh, creating the integration or developing the, the microservice. Also, you can just use a, a shared document and put the architecture there and start reading from, from there. And also, BDB test, which is a talk that is happening right now, so I'm <laughs> really sorry about it. But it's just writing tests in a simple way with plain English and then writing some Python magic in the background so that everything is automated and so on. But this is a really nice way of making sure that others understand what you are working on. Second suggestion that we do to any project. Uh, you need to choose speed versus perfection. We decided to choose speed. Um, it's really worth it. If you are trying to compete with other companies, you need to be faster than, than them. And um, perfection can be achieved in the future. You just need to iterate and try new things. So if this feature never gets interest from our customers, that's it. We just spend a couple of months and, and that's it. We release it and it can be a, a triumph for our but that's it. Something that helped us with speed is the DevOps mindset. Uh, we use a internal rehab tooling called Apesari, many of you might know, that let us spin dashboards, microservices, databases with just a couple of Git repo lines. Um, it's using in the background Terraform, GitHub, OpenShift, GitLab. And it's interesting that it uses OpenShift because we are like collaborating in OpenShift using OpenShift. It's a, a close loop. Um, another really nice tool that we are using are ephemeral environments. It's just a way of spinning up OpenShift clusters, but just for you, not for the customer, for customer-facing APIs. So you just spin up an ephemeral cluster for, for example, just an hour, copy the production or stage environment, and deploy it in your in a cluster but connected to your machine, and then you can start coding and testing your changes there. This is useful for locally testing things, but it's more useful for CI/CD. All of our tests run on real clusters, so we are safer to deploy to, to production. And the last advice that I want to, to tell you is scalability. Uh, if you want not to touch these services in the future, you need to think on scalability beforehand. What we do is put in a proxy uh, between our solution and the customer. So we call it proxy, for example. Uh, it's just a, a stupid microservice. Yes, takes the user request and adds some authentication or patching or whatever mechanism you want to add. But then you have the real stuff in, in the background. You have first the data engineering, which is gathering some data for data enrichment and data engineering. Also preparing the data for the model because each model may need a, a different input. And then we have the inference where we put the model. Now it's running a statistical model, but it's ready for running any machine learning model. And the good thing about this architecture is that everything is stateless. So you can scale it whatever you want. Uh, if the number of users increases a lot, you can scale the inference part or the data engineering part. Also, if you want to go with a huge model like, again, ChatGPT, 
uh, you may need a lot of resources, so you may need to scale the inference part. So it's really comfortable to have something like this. It's simpler to monitor and simpler to scale. So wrapping up, sorry for all this talk. Uh, before starting a, a machine learning project, you need to make sure that you have your problem statement, statement pretty clear, you understand everything that needs to be done. You have the data for, for training this model, um, that you are bringing some business value to the model. And for the productization part, again, uh, recapping, uh, you need to make sure that all of the teams that you have understand and have the same priorities. Remember the trade-off of speed and perfection. So better go to market faster with something that works better than your competitors or something that keep iterating so that you can reach perfection later. And same about scalability. Uh, make sure you have the architecture in place to be able to scale. You don't have to implement it right from the start. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? How many rules did you end up with, R roughly? Three lines of code. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's the logic. Well, the statistical model is same kind of longish lines of code, but it was um, months, weeks talking with subject matter experts, uh, exploring the data, and so on. But it's very cheap to, to, to operate. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to stop there. So. Um, I'm facing a similar problem, so to say, and we're not started to implement yet, so I wanted to ask you um, how much time you invested in the machine learning model before deciding to move on with the uh, IFELS approach? We were not alone in this. We were collaborating with the IBM research team, so the real data scientists were, so we're engineers. <laughs> We dabble in data science, but we are, we are with engineering background. So they were working for two or three months, trying different things. They were trying decision trees because this has to be explainable. That was one of the requirements because we need to tell why exactly the algorithm mm. is going to fail, so what they need to fix. And that's not always possible with machine learning. Yeah. So they tried decision trees, which is kind of explainable. They tried foundational models, so the large language models, kind of like GPT. Um, so two, three months, and then we made a decision in February to do the first release with a simpler model, and we keep working in the background. Okay, thanks. Uh, you mentioned that one of the uh, possible failures was that uh, the data set, the training set, was not large now, so can you quantize uh, like uh, how, how, how big the data set was? We took the data for the last year, the program, or well, if we talk to OpenShift Engineering, they will say it's not a problem. The problem for us is that not so many upgrades fail. <laughs> so we had less than a thousand examples of failure. Mm -hmm. So it was highly imbalanced. We tried to balance it out by excluding some of the successes or pre-classifying it. So we need to, so if we lower the threshold from eight hours to two hours, we would have more failures, but we are not sure if that classification is enough. Was there some recommendation like like 10,000 would be good enough or? We didn't do that analysis. Okay, yeah, thank you. Would this blocking or simulating failures be a kind of way to increase the size of the database or the data set you have to train the model? We need to know then, so it's like chicken and egg problem. We need to know what causes failures. In Kubernetes, there are thousands of metrics, hundreds of alerts. So we ourselves don't know exactly what can cause the upgrade failure. So the data augmentation is possible, but we need to think really carefully that we don't synthesize the data uh, incorrectly. So, yeah, that's a good idea. What was the reaction of uh, your the manager when you, when you solved the three lines of code? <laughs> the manager oh, yeah. is here. <laughs> 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 Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I think the reaction was. <laughs> now the manager perspective. <laughs> Yeah, so we still treat it as a success story because we've learned a lot, we learned a lot about the data, we found out the trade-off about 
uh, of uh, perfection versus speed, and we have several leads to make it. So we hope next <coughs> DevCon will be how we finally switch to machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.